O oh, fool to think that I could hide from all his piercing eyes the gold and silver and costly stones of his holy workmanship. O oh, fool, could I forget the light that filled my bright spheres it was a reflection of his face who called me from the deep. I well remember, for I heard the mild and holy voice saying, O oh, light, spring up and shine, and I sprang up from the deep. He gave to me a silver scepter and crowned me with a golden crown. Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode number 389 of the podcast, which is, of course, called Film Wax Radio. And, of course, I'm your host, Adam Shartoff. Today's show, one guest only, poet, the writer, let's just say the writer, Nick Flynn. But let's see, where do you begin? He has many books of poetry, but his most recent uh, collection is called uh, My Feelings. A lot, many people may know Nick from his memoir called Another Bullshit Night in Suck City, which was eventually adapted into a movie, a screenplay and a movie. And so the book is also out there in one, ver one uh, what would you call, printing called uh, Being Flynn, which is the name of, uh, of course, the film, which starred Paul Dano and Robert De Niro as Nick Flynn and his father, Jonathan Flynn, respectively. And it was about Nick's estrangement with his wayward father and their eventual coming together uh, during the period when uh, Nick was working uh, in a homeless shelter I believe in Boston area, and then his dad showed up looking for a bed one night, and and it goes on from there. And his and his his mother's troubled life, and it's a, it's a very very well, it's a harrowing story, but it's also um, I don't know. I have not seen the movie, but I have read the book, Another Bullshit Night, and there is even a subsequent book called The Reenactments, which uh, is about Nick being an executive producer on Being Flynn and seeing his memoir made into a movie and what that experience was like being on the set. So I was at a poetry reading a number of months ago and Nick Flynn was read a piece of uh, poetry by William Blake. And it's, it turns out it's for an upcoming project and um, that he's collaborating with. Uh, uh, the, he's, I know one of the people he's collaborating with on this project is the musician Noveller, whose music will provide uh, the backdrop to today's podcast. Anyhow, that is the the story, and I met him and I asked him because he had already done a, another friend's uh, podcast. Uh, Paul Lazar, the actor and the director, has been on the show a couple of times, and even for a while, uh, Paul had his own podcast called uh, Talking with Paulie, I believe it was the name of it. And one of the episodes, and I'm sure you can find this online, uh, was with Nick, and I just thought, oh, what a great conversation, and I'd love to to have Nick on the show as well. And so when I was at this poetry reading uh, earlier at the, in the late fall, I think it was, I, I approached him and he said yes immediately. So uh, the other piece of this, uh, this interesting story, I guess, is that Nick is married to the actress Lily Taylor, who is, uh, you know, one of the great actresses in our country. And uh, of course, Lily did the podcast some time ago when she was in a movie called Coldlands, which shot upstate New York and I had on Tom Gilroy, who shot the uh, the movie, and also, of course, Lily. So it is nice to sort of bring on her husband, Nick, uh, onto the podcast. And so, and uh, as you heard in that little opening sequence there, that little clip, Nick will be reading poetry by William Blake. I, I just have to say that in this time of you know, uh, political muscle flexing. We're in a kind of, a, I think, you know, in this negative period of time. Well, it's no secret. Everybody, a lot, many people may think that. Hopefully, many of you who listen, you know, where we're we're now making it much more difficult for for anyone to enter this country, uh, and for helping refugees, for building walls between nations. This is this is a time to share poetry. That's, I guess that's what I'm trying to say. It feels it feels right to have episodes like like the one you're about to hear, which are about creativity and emotional leading on emotional lives. Uh, yeah, I, I think it's important, and so it's certainly what I try to do. Um, so we'll, we're going to play this conversation. It's a nice, you know, lengthy conversation, and uh, I, I think I. I certainly hope you do enjoy it. Uh, and if you do, pick up some of uh, Nick's work, um, his memoirs or his books of poetry. You won't be sorry. 
I think a lot of his poetry is published by Grey Wolf Press, just an FYI, but it's largely available where books are sold um, online, certainly. So uh, this is this is it. Nick Flynn is on Film Wax Radio, episode number 389. I don't think I'm going to be back after. I don't think uh, there's much reason. Usually at that point, I'm always asking you to, you know, subscribe on iTunes if you haven't done so, or Stitcher. And uh, we're also now on YouTube, I should mention. Uh, I do strip the show of music uh, and other clips and stuff because uh, it, I run into problems on YouTube. But it, the show is up there as well, so you can always access it through YouTube uh, or, you know, slowly adding episodes. So that's all I'm going to say. If you do go on iTunes, please do leave a star rating and a comment there. That, that would be very thoughtful of you. So without any further hesitation, let's get into my conversation with the writer, Nick Flynn. Uh, I just turned on the recorder. Just so. I, as I mentioned, uh, Paul Lazar was on twice. He was one of my first guests, yeah, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. I just, he was in a friend's movie, a little independent film that nobody ever saw called Bass Ackwards. Oh, yeah. And, uh, I didn't see it, but I love, I love it when he appears in any Oh, movie. you should see it. He has a really funny, small but funny, memorable really? role. Really? Yeah. yeah, Bass Ackwards. Uh-huh. I, I, if you can't find it, let me know. I, I can get a link because the filmmaker is a friend. Yeah. And, um, but I had seen him, of course, in a number of things. You don't forget Paul. He's such a striking yeah, look, yeah. obviously, and he's such a fine actor. Yeah. But um, when I saw it, I just I t- I spontaneously just decided to hunt him down and, yeah. and invite him on to my and, – and, you know, it was, it was really when I – right as, as I started it. So. Yeah. But it was kind of inter- and significant because I thought, first of all, our rapport, he was so sweet and yeah. so giving as a guest. Mm-hmm. And unguarded, and just sort of, it was enjoying himself. He was in this little studio in Brooklyn, and uh, yeah, it was just really. It just realized, oh, this I can do this, and I can invite people on that I want just to have on, yeah, based on yeah. instinct of this is somebody I want to talk to. Yeah, and you're yeah. kind of the same. It's, yeah. I had the same uh, feeling about you. So thanks again for. Do you want to hear yourself? By the way, I can make that happen too. No. Okay. <laughs> just sit a little closer to. Yeah. Just a little yeah. bit because it, I can, it's, uh, I can it sit. sounds a little warmer. But that's it. Good to um, sit wherever, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I actually have uh, a nice hardbound copy of the, the your. Let me get my glasses. Oh sure, sure. Because you're gonna want to read or something. I mean, yeah, I don't, I don't need to hear. Right? <laughs> no, 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 not at all. It just some t- I give people the option. Yeah, I'm creeped out enough as it is by. Recording myself lately, even oh. this morning, recording myself reading because I'm doing this uh, this whole Blake thing, this Blake performance. So, oh, tell me about that since yeah. you brought it up. Why don't you just yeah. what's going on with that? I, I, I've been working on this. Uh, I gave a talk about Blake at the. Uh, I forgot to take which one. I don't even know which one is mine now. Did you take a couple of big gulps or? No, I think this is you. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, Soon it wouldn't matter. By the end of this, <laughs> you'll, you'll be drinking out of the same cup. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Um, yeah, a couple, like in 2014, I see here at the Bowery Poetry Club, mm-hmm. that's what was part of this uh, Blake presentation oh, or, okay. or just talk. Like it was, there was this Blake energy around because some sort of anniversary of his birth or death or, or something. Um, William Blake. William Blake. And he, William uh, T. Blake. Uh, and and mm-hmm. in Good. preparing for that, I found these like things that, you know, probably other Blake people know about, but not many people. And, I'm, you know, I've been a poet for a while and... You know, they say he's one of the least uh, poets, the least served by anthologies. Like, there's just sort of, you know, there's like a few poems that people read in anthologies. It is not his, like, brilliance. And you can't really tell from reading those why he's such a big deal. And is that okay? You can have, <laughs> yeah, we can have the dog snoring. In the it's a mainstay now. Whenever yeah. I do it, I, the yeah, dog yeah. likes to be around, you yeah. know, people. And, and then so it makes some noises. She just <laughs> snores really, if it gets really loud, I might move her. But. And, uh, and so I, and I found this thing that he, he did called uh, Vala. Uh, so he created this sort of, uh, he created this universe and, you know, had these characters in it, uh, Vala and uh, Urizan and, and uh, Luva and these different people that it's sort of like a mystical universe, but it's apocalyptic. It's like an apocalyptic prophecy. Mm-hmm. And it's in nine books. He worked on it for 10 years. He never finished it. He abandoned it. Uh, and it's just sort of this this thing that's like nine year and, and he abandoned it. Yeah, <laughs> ten year project, nine books, like thousand, like yeah. like four thousand lines, um, and so I sort of like I read. So I, I've sort of been 
wrestling with that for like the last like three years, uh-huh. and uh, I, I've distilled it down. It's sort of this. I've distilled it down to now to thirty pages, all nine books, and uh, uh, and I've done some a presentation of it. I did this sort of performance of it last year in Boston at the Museum of Fine Arts with this uh, friend of mine who performs under the name uh, Noveller. Uh, she's a guitarist, does these sort of very ambient, weird, loopy guitar stuff, mm-hmm. um, pedals and feedback Loops and things. and what, whatnot. And uh, she's really fantastic. You'd find, find her, uh, you know, you should look her up. Sarah Lipstate is her name, but the band's name is Noveller. Noveller? Yeah. I will. Yeah, and... Uh, so we did this. We did one. We did the first book. We did like our performance of the first book, and it was it was it went well. And then I've I've managed to get this uh, uh, organization in London to fund us to, is bringing us over to present all nine books mm-hmm. in February. So we're presenting the whole thing with her, me and her, and then this filmmaker from uh, from Houston, Gabe Martinez. Uh, the three of us are going over there. Presents in a few different venues in London for like ten days. So. Uh, so it'll be there'll be a visual component. Is what yeah, you're saying, yeah, as well yeah, as yeah. We'll have we'll have projections and mm-hmm. sound yeah, and yeah. text and yeah, yeah. It helps. Things. Does it help the bells and it's not bells and whistles. I don't mean to demean it in any way. But do you have to? Do you does is getting harder? Well, it's a, it's an you know the the vala is a you know it's unfinished. It's really like it, it you know it might be you know sacrilege to some to say like that I'm editing Blake, but I'm <laughs> deeply <laughs> distilling Blake. <laughs> Like deeply, it's a thing he abandoned. So it's like it really needed, it, like in order to, for I think, in order for me to access it, I've really had to go down and distill it down. There's unbelievably beautiful language. Some people say that the, like the, some scholar, maybe Northrop Pry or somebody, I forget who it was, or said that the ninth book is like the the the, the greatest explosion of creative poetic energy in the English language. It's just like this amazing. It is really amazing. It's an amazing thing, but it's dense. It's like you know, you're just hacking away at this like this this landscape and world is created and you find these like really beautiful passages mm. so i have it down to passages i see she plays i read some she plays oh i got it yeah so, so it's not like a, it. you had a, a sort of an emotional response to yeah after yeah. really distilling it yeah so it's yeah. not and and, but it's, and as far as improve i don't think you're claiming you're, you're improving on anything I'm distilling it yeah. yes i understand yeah. and also i mean people have been mm. uh I think uh, doing far more to like Shakespeare, who is probably the most famous writer of all time, right? And, yeah. and his works have been yeah, changed, you're morphed in many adapted, ways, yeah, morphed in yeah. every which way possible. And, and he, you know, Shakespeare also sampled from a lot of people. Uh, you know, he's, they say, right? Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah I yeah. think they, there's, clear, there's clear precedence to his right. plays, and uh, and and but doesn't diminish the plays. And Blake also, I mean, there's these apocalyptic prophecies, mm-hmm. you know come directly from you know the book of revelations mm-hmm. you know there's there's that energy is in them so mm-hmm. you know yeah, uh, I, yeah. and s- this is or is it how how I- instrumental is is engaging with other existing poetry for you as a poet uh is it is it does it inspire your own writing as well uh, well uh you know when i you know first i mean it's my first way I was exposed to poetry was uh, by reading other people's poetry and then usually it was dead poets and then sort of at some point I realized that, that some of them were actually alive still and that was an accident and then, <laughs> <laughs> then I got to meet some of them and you know become friends with some of them and it's just sort of a you know gradual progression but it's always I mean you know that's a, for me one of the beauties of poetry is you, you can read a book of poetry in, in an hour and you know, you can read a book of poetry like multiple times. Like, not you know, there's a few novels I've read multiple times, but not many. Yeah. Uh, but what what is it about it? I mean, the, the, there are different almost disciplines in a sense. So they're yeah. m- unfair, maybe even kind of put them in the same category. Well, just well, it's just it's also the commitment too. It's just you can read the entire book in an hour. Right. Um, sure. Sure. Yeah, you can't read a book of a novel in an hour generally. Hopefully not. No, hopefully not. <laughs> yeah. Especially you can read a not short story in an Flynn. hour, but yeah. yeah. So, uh, so there's that, just that, and then and each time you go in, which is probably the same for a great novel too. You you, you enter it in a different way. You're you're in a different space, uh, you know, psychically, and so it's going to resonate differently. Um, but with poetry, like it's yeah, it's, it's yeah, like there's just so, certain poems that, and that they they all the ones I return to too are ones that seem really mysterious. I don't really know how they do it, but I'm having some sort of a emotional or energetic or mystical response to them that isn't really on an intellectual level not clear mm-hmm. why that's happening you mm-hmm. know it's not like uh uh so i can so i 
there's a certain pleasure in going back into it because it's it's, it's entering into like mystery, a, a mysterious experience, a mystical experience. Even sometimes. Do you remember it, one of your earliest heroes or earliest it, a poetry? It's, yeah, one of the early poets that really. Well, I, I was very lucky. I mean, at I, some I was, point you said, "Oh, I I want to do this." Well, you know, there's there's always been like it, you know, if you go back, you go you can go back and and you know, we all have poems like. I, I think. I mean, it's terrible to make gross generalizations because probably some people don't have poems, but you know, f- fairy tales and, and nursery rhymes and things like that. Are, we're always sort of, you know, we're part of growing up. And at a, cer- a certain point in sixth grade, I was required to memorize a poem, which I think was a cool thing. Like it, it's, it seemed like, and I, I don't remember it being onerous. I remember it being hmm. kind of like, okay, I'll do this. And I, cause I was really very uh, morbid as a sixth grader. And, uh, I was reading Edgar Allan Poe. I'm like, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna memorize the Raven, which is like a four page poem, and I did. Okay, I memorized this long poem, and I still have like like maybe a page of it. You know, I can still like it's just sort of in the way it gets in there to memorize something that early, it gets in very deeply, and then right, yeah, that then, doesn't it sticks. Yeah, yes, yeah, and it gets in like cellular level or something, and then you know. If, you know, we, the, the one book of poetry, you know, uh, sort of, you know, wonderfully or tragically around my house that I can remember was was Ariel. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. that was like sort of the book of poetry that was around our house. I didn't really read it, but it was just, it was, I knew it was there. Um, I got into like every teenager, I think, still to this day, got into Bukowski mm-hmm. at a certain point, you know, and then rejected Bukowski. Okay. You know, like so, you sort of. Uh-huh. Embrace and reject. Yep. Oh, the, as opposed to the other way around. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it could. Yeah, it depends. I guess who you are. But um, and, and then it got into the. Then I got into poetry. Like in, as an undergraduate at, at UMass Amherst, I, I took a workshop. I heard there was a famous poet there that, a famous young poet that was there that that I I, I was a creator. I was an English major and, and was studying writing, and I was just like, I don't know anything about poetry. Like I'll, I'll take a class with this guy. Mm-hmm. I hadn't heard about James Tate. Mm-hmm who's, you know, great American poet. And uh, so I took a workshop with him, and he, he just had us read a contemporary book of poetry, maybe a book that came out that year, uh, uh, you know, one book a week, so 14 books. We read a book a week. And that's where I realized you could read a book pretty quickly. Yeah. Uh, and you could actually have an experience with the book pretty quickly, and you'd write, you'd write something, you know, how to write a page or two pages or something. So it required your your yeah. full engagement and and it was not such not a just, crazy yeah. range of like voices and dictions and 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 styles and, and these were again new these were contemporary living, living contemporary, poets okay yeah, i don't In think any 80s. of them were dead yeah no not yeah not, they're all alive yeah they're mm-hmm. all alive they're all i think the books might have just come out that year like he just sort of and he had fantastic taste like really good taste unless that was a particularly good year for poetry i don't know but he uh-huh. they all seemed like very sort of major uh uh books i can still remember i can remember all of them you know dennis johnson was one of them uh-huh. like before he wrote jesus son he you know was a poet and uh carolyn forche uh etheridge knight uh yeah charles wright they were just like this you know michael burkhard uh giselle mueller lizelle mueller uh and this was like know, i guess we're around 1980 82 82 82 yeah it was a fall of 82 mm-hmm. i was taking that poetry class yeah yeah and and um i guess you, your your life at home was pretty chaotic so yeah i guess it, it you know when uh when one's in the midst of it it doesn't sort of it just seems like that's what life is so mm-hmm. did, did maybe well let's see you would have been still pretty young um you were living in, in massachusetts uh, oh amherst i guess reasonably close to yeah, so where two, like your a two mom hour was, motorcycle right? ride yeah yeah i had oh, a motorcycle i'd go back and forth on the motorcycle. Term, not on the turn mass pike yeah on the mass pike on yeah. 90 Just, yeah i'd shoot on the motorcycle yeah back and forth did yeah. you pay tolls yeah, of course you did no no <laughs> no we had a, we had a friend who worked uh who who got some summer job for the the mass pike and he uh he pointed oh. out that there was a that he just was like, well, how do you get on the pike and off? Do you pay? And he's like, no, there's just you just get off at the police station and just go through the gates. So we just always, never, ever paid. We always went just through where the workers went and just waved to the cops and just went through. As if we were, we go, what do you do with the cops? You go, you just wave to them. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what we did. We went right by the state police station, uh-huh. and there's a gate there that says, do not go out this gate. You go through the gate, and right. then you're out in yeah. without paying. We did it every time. This is a different time, too. I don't know if you could quite get away. <laughs> also, I just rode, drove on the pike about two week, uh, Thanksgiving weekend, 
and they don't even have toll booths anymore. So now, I mean, they're it's all operated, you know, with these uh, scanners now. So on the other end, before with, it's with, a different world. Without being able to do that, the other end there, there was a way where I, I literally drove the across a field to not pay in the other end on the on the mm-hmm. UMass end. I would drive across a field mm-hmm. and then through like a break in a fence down a hill on my motorcycle, down a hill out to a road, like. I'd like yeah, sort of ski yeah. like dirt so bike, like, like a dirt bike, like a dirt bike. Evil yeah. Knievel was still around then. Yeah, right? so, yeah. But so uh, do that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, in eighty two, eighty three, uh, or in the early eighties in general, which is around the time I moved to Boston myself, yeah. I was there, living in the Jamaica Plain area uh, from eighty three to eighty five. That was a good time to be there. It was uh, a different time, and I yeah. don't think, and I had this my granddad's uh, Chevy Impala, uh-huh. which was like a real a road boat. hog. It yeah. was a boat. Yeah, a boat. Yeah. Yeah. And it, I, you, driving uh, all the way across, how much that, that might have been 250 I mean, I don't know. I know, but that, 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 that was like a six pack. I that's mean, true. I wasn't going to spend <laughs> that on tolls. I mean, that's, <laughs> well, that's another question about your drives across. Where, where they, <laughs> We'd already spent it on beer for mm-hmm. the drive. I see. Yeah, okay. so we didn't have the money. It was much less boring a drive. Yeah. Yeah. Understood. Um, well, there must have been a couple of close calls. I'm just even <laughs> even in in sober drives across the turnpike. I'm, um, but uh, well, I'm just wondering if if the if by then you were already so engaged in poetry and in love with poetry. It sounds like even just how you're reminiscing about those that professor and those particular uh, yeah. that exposure and the discovery of living poets and thought. Well, of course, oh, I'm living and mm-hmm. I like poetry. I could be a living poet. That kind of gave a sense of order or contrast to the, the the time at home because your mom was really struggling. Yeah, yeah. This, you know, that was I, actually that semester that I was taking the poetry workshop is the semester she committed suicide. Oh, uh, and it was okay. right in December, uh, and so the semester was just ending, uh, and I, you know, but I left school before it ended, uh, and um, yeah, but it was you know, but uh, you know, our you know, we we struggle. In a, uh, it's not a very sort of cinematic way. It's a very mm-hmm. quiet way. So, uh, and you don't think my, about my it. people, the poets, my maybe? people. I don't know my family. Oh, you're okay. yeah, yeah. We're not we're not like Italian or Catholic or something. You I know? see. So yeah, Jewish. I mean, we're waspy, uh-huh. waspy struggles. You uh-huh. know, almost invisible. Uh, so, oh, nobody. There's not something where there was a lot of uh, manifestation. Well, I say that of if emotion. I say that, yeah, if I Is say that, that, but then if I actually talk about things there was huge manifestations yeah if i if i list them but then to me they were diminished like i didn't pay attention to them so as i was kind of just doing my due diligence though but i was you know thinking like obviously going from 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 um single mother struggling with alcohol maybe meant i don't know mental illness is it safe to say no i don't think she was mentally ill at all okay okay no No, she wasn't no she wasn't mentally ill at all okay unless Uh, unless i'm mentally ill and that's the filter <laughs> that you're keep looking through. No, I don't know enough about that. So, uh, but I, uh, but just the idea of of losing her, and then poetry, and then working in the Pine Wood Pine Street Inn. Pine yeah. Street Inn, excuse me. Yeah, uh, it just seems like uh, choosing. I maybe it wasn't feeling like a choice. I don't know. I mean, like it seems like to, to end up in the shelter. Yeah, and, and to stu- and to kind of pursue poetry and writing. Well, poetry seems to be more more of where you were heading uh, to yeah. to be a poet. Uh, it just seems like uh, beyond romantic at this stage. <laughs> you know, <laughs> this these choices uh, as a, especially someone young in their twenties. Yeah, I mean, I had other and, things I was doing too. I mean, I was you know when she died, I was an electrician's apprentice. Um, I had a trade. Which I continued doing for about a year, and then I, I just sort yeah. of, it sort of lost meaning, or maybe I didn't continue it that long. After. Was the was your mentor? What do they call it? No, what what do they call the um, the your your apprenticing to, for a master a ma- electrician? Uh, or yeah, I mean maybe he was uh, just. I'm saying he. I assume it was a he. It was, it was a he. Yeah. It was a rock. Maybe some a rock or somebody just who was, was, was he, he a, a friend? Like could be a friend to you as well. Oh. No, no. Okay. Uh, I mean, they were fine. The the people I worked for, there was you know, that was a whole another complicated story. Which, you know, it was, it was my mother's boyfriend was this this uh, drug dealer, gangster type guy, and these were the people that worked with them. But the electrician was they just needed someone that, that uh, did electrical work. <laughs> well, I get it. I, I'm just searching for that male figure. It, because uh, I want that a mentor for you or something in or, your story. I want well, that in the, your narrative. Well, I want one, there to be. Well, there was that one guy. like like when I was working with those guys, 
there was one drunken carpenter, Peter, who was, you know, kind of a jerk, but, you know, we, we worked together. We, you know, we worked together. He was, you know, pretty hardcore alcoholic. You know, he was living in that, literally like a, what was that, Chris Farley thing. He was living in a trailer. He was living in a truck the river. In, in, the, in the state park, you know, with a cooler, yeah. you know, and his wife left his wife. It was paradise. And, <laughs> and he was just sort of like, like wow, this, is, this doesn't look good. You know, like I was just like that. But he was like, you know, he'd come into work every day, hung over, and he was a good carpenter. And, but then I, and I was like, okay, I'll just keep doing this work. And then at a certain point, I got, I got into UMass. Um, I got into By U- your writing samples? No, no, I don't your, know how. Your, it, was your... just like, it was just like a Mooney wedding or something. Like I went to a public school. <laughs> they, I think they just – everyone who goes to the public school, the, the counselor or something, uh-huh. the, just put your name into the state school. Oh, they do that almost – I don't know. I, I mean, I don't remember applying. I don't remember applying, but I got an acceptance letter. Um, it wasn't I something I wish I had had that experience. Yeah. And suddenly I was accepted <laughs> to UMass. I was like, did I apply to UMass? Like I didn't remember doing that, but could your mother have done it? No, oh, definitely not. No, <laughs> definitely I don't know. Not. You know, just, so I got into UMass, but I, I wasn't going to go. I was like, I got this job. I'm making good money. Like, why am I going? And I, and the copper just said to me, which was like sort of a mentor, mentor experience. Uh, uh, he said, don't, don't, don't be an asshole. You got your whole life to work. Like go to school. Like, don't, don't, be a, don't be an idiot. That's good advice. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, oh, okay. He's like, does, these jobs, you're always going to have this stupid job, you know? <laughs> this is not a problem. So. so I was an electrician. Then when I got out, when my mother died, like, it made less sense to do that. And working with the homeless made more sense for some reason. I don't know why, but it made more sense. So, And, and I worked there for almost 10 years. I mean, th- throughout my 20s, oh, I worked at, there. At the uh, shelter. At the shelter, right. Maybe seven years or something, but it was a long time. Like, that's like. That is a long time. Seven years for is like 10 that years. Age especially. Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, <laughs> like I didn't leave till I was like 30. So Right. It was a dick. It was a, that's what you did in your 20s. I get it. Uh, and uh, that that area of uh, Massachusetts, Amherst also, you were there for, you, did you, you said you I didn't, didn't I, I dropped out. So I was there for like three and a half years. It's amazing. Right. Yeah. And I, I have out. a similar yeah. story about yeah. my <laughs> three years, but um that especially that is like kind of a, a bastion that Amherst w- with a number of colleges, yeah, Ber- uh, the five sisters, yeah, and there it's very liberal, very yes. progressive. It was during a very early days of PC uh, where I wonder how striking that was for you and how much maybe it influenced you. And it, there had to be kind of like a, a contrast to be political, to be political, or like to well, work with the homeless. Or? Uh, no, no, no. Well, I'm not so much political as just so, as social. I guess socially progressive more than. I mean, it definitely was politically progressive. A lot of students chose those schools because they came from that kind of upbringing or background. But uh, I imagine there was quite a contrast from the rougher. You know, sides of like Boston growing up. Yeah, there. Well, scared, it, was, you were scared, it was interesting. Or the na- neighborhood you grew up in, which was very. Well, it wasn't a rough neighborhood I grew up in, but my mother dated rough guys. Rough guys, and like so that you know, I came from when I was going to school. I was still working with the gangsters, and so my job on the weekends, I'd ride home in my motorcycle, work with the gangsters, make money, go back to school, and yeah, it was strange. But I was also then, you know, my girlfriend at the time up there at school, you know, was very progressive. Uh, she was in the. I don't know. She was in the Radical Student Union, but she was, you know, she was working at like Earth Foods at the sort of yeah, you know alternative places, and yeah, she was she was became, more connected to that sort yeah. of alternative political thing. But I already had a political consciousness going in there, like working. Uh, yeah, I had a political consciousness from just growing up. Like I just had this sort of class consciousness. It was just like in, in your in. system already. It was yeah, uh, yeah, and something because that, you know, that didn't seem to come from, although I don't know, maybe it did come from your, your parents or your grandparents or. No, no, it came from, uh, uh, it, it probably came from my first girlfriend when I was in high school or just out of high school. Or okay. I guess still in high school. She, her, her father was really left. He was a history professor at a high school and they were just really like, and you know, I think Reagan was just getting into power or something. And like, they were just really like, politically engaged like and i just yeah. really was interested in it i could sort of see like they're yeah they're there and, and it sort of made sense like they're that leftist view made sense to me and, and umass was very leftist so i took some uh, classes like that up there but i wasn't i, I kind of didn't really feel like i fit into like the radical student union and stuff they felt uh, it felt a little elitist or something little, to me oh, oh yeah i could see that so a little bit like yeah, uh, so I didn't really fit in there, but I ended up getting a house with these Very righteous. five yeah. radical lesbian feminists that, uh, they weren't all lesbians, but 
they were radical. And that, it's, is it branding? You're yeah, branding the, the that, group. That, okay. that they, you know, <laughs> but they, they were, they were like connected to the radical yes. student union and stuff. Yeah, and they yeah. were like sort of, so I was in that group. Yeah. Like, in, but on the, per, oh, I was always in the periphery of things as, you know, yeah. in some way. But that but I was definitely wasn't in like the, with the MBA crowd or the fraternity crowd or I was more in the leftist crowd. Gotcha. Uh, so going into work with maybe, the homeless maybe. was another political, it felt like a political act. I remember uh, also a little later in the 80s, maybe 86, I, went, I, I had been going to this lefty summer camp. I grew up kind of w- in a very lefty. Where was that? It was in, at, well, in, initially upstate here, uh-huh. up, up in uh, the Hudson Valley. What's it called? Camp Thoreau, uh-huh. <laughs> as in our poet. Mm-hmm. It was in outside of New Paltz, uh, up just up uh, in a town called Walkill. Mm-hmm. Um, and then at some point there was like a divide, and and the guy that was running our summer camp day to day, he 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 took the group up to Vermont. And by then I was old enough to be a counselor, camp counselor. So and I was going to school, and so I I uh, decided to go up to Vermont. So it it was near the New Hampshire border, but it was up in Vermont. And uh, and in my first, one of my first summers as a staffer, I met a good girl named Sarah who, uh, she, of course her name is Sarah, who was actually going to Dartmouth, which is not a lefty Why, of school. course, is her name Sarah? Because it's always, because I, I, I don't know. She, she, there was <laughs> I'm Sarah, sorry. Sarah I, is like the name of the <laughs> archetype of the, what, the, who I'm describing, I think, Sarah. <laughs> I don't know what she saw in me because I was not, even though I was going to this, this uh, lefty camp and played guitar, and uh, I, I just, I wasn't. Like she was part of the student uh, SDS, SDS, right? Mm-hmm. Student for Democratic Society, mm-hmm. I think it was called. Yeah. So she was. I mean, she was really committed to it. Not. It wow. wasn't just like a you know sort of a phase for her. And so I was just really impressed with her, and she was very ad- attractive. I was very attracted to her. But I just and I remember her telling me that I reminded of her friends back home, and I know she had a difficult relationship with her family on some level. And they were from Arlington, you know. I don't know what it was. It, there was a, some sort of problems. I know. I just never got her to really open up about it, you know. And we weren't together that long. But she had a real influence on me in that yeah, that way yeah. too. Like yeah. just of, I I no longer felt like I should just be I don't know casual about. It. There was so much going on in the world at the time. Not that there isn't now. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that's the thing. I think you 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 know whoever you get attracted to or gets attracted to you or who you end up hanging out with. It's not like I don't think it's completely accidental you know like you I mean, if you went and talked to someone from you know a, a young trump type person or something you know maybe that would just you just got you wouldn't click with that person mm-hmm. you know like that would just be a thing you just wouldn't really right. you, you wouldn't have a kinship maybe if you know so you, you find your tribe and your you know whatever it is whatever led you to that point so yeah growing up with like a single mother who was working class and you know we had to think about money and things like that and and uh uh one of my first like class things though happened when I was eight. I'm writing about it now, because um, I have my you know I have this uh, eight year old daughter. So it was when I was seven. Uh, there was an, a guy in my hometown named Mr. Mann. Uh, I think I talked about this in another interview too, because um, I've been working on this book for a while now. And uh, is this more of a, a memoir or? Yeah. Well, I don't know what it is. It's okay. like something. Doesn't um, matter. Yeah, fairy tale maybe, but it's verse. Yeah. Prose. Uh, okay. Uh, and he, uh, you know, he's like sort of a hermit type, lived in his house in town. If you went near the house, my grandmother said he would shoot you with a shotgun. You shouldn't, couldn't go near it. And so I, I spent the whole summer trying to get as close as I could to it. The Boo Radley. Yeah, to try to like, yeah. to try to get him to shoot me. It was, it was sort of rock salt. Like it wouldn't kill you, but it would like sting you. Oh, he actually did shoot with something. That's what he would shoot. Oh, He'd shoot oh, you with this actually, rock salt. Wasn't yeah. just a well, I don't know if he did. Lie. He never shot me, but that was the story. <laughs> okay. uh, but I, tr- I was hoping he would because for some reason. Uh, which is a whole nother story, why I would hope him to do that. Uh, so, but then that winter he died. And I found out when I was, uh, when I was eight, he died. Like I spent the summer, you know, tracking him and trying to get close to his house. And then that winter he died. And I found out he died because the city, the town, or the, the, the gas company, the electric company shut his heat off and he froze to death. And I was just like, it was sort of a, really the beginning of class consciousness. Like they killed him because he's poor. Like I was just sort of shocked. I was just like, that's wrong. Like, and cause yeah. he was really like a mythic figure to me too. He was this yeah. mythic figure in my town. Um, and I really like paid a lot of attention to him in, in order to, t- I'd see him everywhere. Like I would just track him and just see him. Like he was huh. like, you know, if you're in a crowd, like there he is, you know, there's sure. Yeah. He was glowing. And then he died. They killed him. Yeah. The town killed but him. Does yeah. it take time for you to freeze to death? 
Is no, it, can't you, no. No? You could just work with the homeless. Yeah, the people, you oh, die quick. Yeah, oh, maybe he's already. <laughs> you die quick. Hypothermia sets in. Then you, the hypothermia sets in, and then you just you 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 die peacefully. Uh, you actually you don't feel it. You just you're sort of numb and and it drunk. It's like you're drunk. It, it, it mimics drunkenness. Uh, so you're sort of you're delirious. Yeah. A level of shock on yeah. stuff, right? Yeah. yeah. Wow. No, no, you can go pretty fast. You can freeze it up pretty I quick, just right? thought maybe the time leading up to that that phase where you're really cold must just take a while, and then you just sort of say, but let me go do. someplace. But, you know, if, you're if, right. if you, suppose you're sleeping in the night, and they shut the heat off in the middle of the night. They shut you your power off. And you're maybe older? Is he, yeah, he was, he was old. Guy. He was old, so yeah. He, he was an old guy, yeah. was probably especially fast. He was like in his 90s. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. He was like 92. So, oh, okay. Yeah. So yeah, but he was getting around though. He was he'd, he'd walk around all town. He was like sure. a guy. Yeah, so. yeah, he could have been li- lived to ninety three or four. You know, he never know. even longer. That's true. Who knows? Yeah. So so these this is a, a work another work based in nostalgia. Anyway, if not, uh, I hate to uh, use the word nostalgia. I know memory uh, memory. Yeah, sense thank memory. you. Yeah, okay, yeah. I bet. that's yeah. a, it's a better word. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I agree with you. I'm so uh, naive. I, mean, you know, I apologize. Um, you know, this but, is another one of your nostalgic works. <laughs> Sorry. Well, you wrote a trilogy. That's that's how it the was marketed. Trilogy, I think it's called. A, it's a nostalgia <laughs> trilogy. Uh, <laughs> memoirs. Well, you're still so you're still a young guy. I mean, well, you're I'm, I'm roughly your age, I suppose. Roughly so. young. So I like to think of you as a young guy. <laughs> In the scheme of things, not it, as old as Mr. Man. No, not no. I, I That's no. why I love that Mr. Man living. I like the idea of him living to ninety six or seven because then I still would be yeah, yeah. firmly middle aged and you're, not you're even only halfway there. Exactly. <laughs> I really like that thought. Um, sadly, I'm already uh, like yourself. I think I'm uh, past the halfway mark already. That was a tough. That was a tough one. For the halfway me. mark. Yeah, I mean, you know, knowing. Yeah, that that was like that. I could no you're longer about 50 or crunching something? numbers past fifty. But yeah, for yeah. Fi- sure fifty yeah. because you're cr- no matter how you crunch the numbers, you're going downhill. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. you're just you're on the you, other side of the mountain. You're, yeah, you live longer than you're going. You've lived. Your your life, you've lived longer than you are going to. Uh, maybe I should read some Blake. Maybe that would help you. That's always a pick. yeah, yeah. Maybe you that read. would like. Now, is this again the? This, this is, is the from work that Violet you were... Night the second. Yeah, because that would you know if you're because before. By the way, I was going to ask you if you could still remember some of the uh, Raven, just as a kind of like a, a test, and I I'll just take your word for it. But read the read. Yeah, read okay, this. Okay, I'll from... read. This is the end of the fifth night. Oh, did I oh did I keep the horses of the day in silver pastures? Oh, I refused the Lord of day, the horses of his prince. Oh, did I close my treasuries with roofs of solid stone and darkening all my palace walls with envyings and hate. Oh, fool to think that I could hide from all his piercing eyes the gold and silver and costly stones of his holy workmanship. Oh, fool, could I forget the light that filled my bright spheres was a reflection of his face who called me from the deep. I well remember, for I heard the mild and holy voice saying, O light, spring up and shine and I sprang up from the deep he gave to me a silver scepter and crowned me with a golden crown and said go forth and guide my son who wanders in the ocean I went not forth I hid myself in black clouds of my wrath I called the stars around my feet in the night of councils dark the stars threw down their spears and fled naked away we fell does that help you (laughs) (laughs) with worrying about Entering the abyss. Well, it just it's uh, it sounds like um, almost like a uh, well the the night, mm-hmm. the night uh, part. Yeah, the stars throwing their spears. I know the feeling. I know yes. the feeling. That's a familiar sense. I. That's also a, a, a line of his that he stole. He stole that from himself, or else he he repurposed that line because that's also in the tiger. Oh. Uh, the the stars threw down their spears. Yeah, that's like a. I believe that's a line in the tiger. Huh. Yeah. I Heaven guess. threw down her spears. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful image. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. It, I, I, you know, I'm sure he may not have even been aware of that he borrowed from himself. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He may, may not have been aware, aware of, of it that he did that. That he. Oh yeah, I steal from myself all the time. Oh, I, yeah. aware, aware, or, or after no, the no, fact. No. no, not not always. No, not at all. Yeah. No, no not always. Yeah. Did you want to read another passage? 
uh, I was trying to think because that one seemed almost too pretty, like compared to it like the some pretty. that are like quite, it, yeah, that are quite uh, like. Would, I was hoping to frighten you a little bit more. Um, it, no, it, there was that element. Really, it, it seemed like um, like gods and and um, you know wrathful gods I, and. Um, I think right at the beginning there's some. Yeah, I'll, I'll do this one. The, like this is nice. Uh, um, yeah, this this could be good. Okay, this is from Night the First. I see the invisible knife. I see the shower of blood. I see the swords and spears of futurity. Though in the brain of man we live and in his circling nerves, though this bright world of all our joy is in the human brain, let us refuse the plow and spade, the heavy roller and spiked harrow, burn all these cornfields, throw down all these fences. Fattened on human blood and drunk with wine of life is better far than all these labors of the harvest and the vintage. See the river run red with the blood of men, swell lustful round my rocking knees. Stuff like that. Wow. Yeah. What has he got against agriculture? <laughs> the whole world. It's like it's an apocalyptic vision. It's yeah, like the yeah. end of the world. It's like he's a, uh, you know, it's 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 over. It's in its you know it's it's about the creative destruction. You know, to, you know, you get to wipe the state clean, and uh, start again. So, and if it's well, even before global. Uh, you know, with gl- climate uh, change and yeah. all that, because I mean, there is definitely that that anxiety now mm-hmm. with, yeah. at the end of the world. Yeah, there's a lot that feels very uh, contemporary in it. That, which it does is why I guess it's a, a yeah. Uh, and I, and I do feel a little anxiety when you were reading the first passage too, because my biggest, I feel when I feel really small, mm-hmm. it, it makes me. You know, I think this is common. This is not uncommon anyway. Like when you're looking up at the stars, and which is not. Mm-hmm. Because of the infrequency of it living in a city like New York, you don't see the open open universe. Yeah. Uh, you, you we just see occasional stars. Oh, it's pretty. But when mm-hmm. you get out out of the city and then you're exposed to it, it feels sometimes so overwhelming and beautiful, of course. But also that feeling of feeling so small and lost and mm-hmm. insignificant is it's it's uh, scary. And I had that same sort of anxiety when I'm when I'm in the open sea uh, that I feel just so small, and um, uh, the sea feels dangerous, very yeah. dangerous. Yeah. Like it's something I can't control, of course. And I'm just yeah. I think it's uh, it's good to be afraid of certain things. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> or or just to see one's place in the, you know, that you know, it's almost you can dissolve into it into something bigger or feel overcome by it uh is like sort of a you know so you sort of flutter between the two mm-hmm. you know like mm-hmm. feeling insignificant and then just feeling part of it mm-hmm. at the same time mm-hmm. you know yeah ideal i guess i don't know i guess the ideal is to feel part of it you know mm-hmm. and not like crushed by it that's a good point when you were uh when you so you have a seven-year-old daughter you said she's is eight now eight yeah i think i met her mm-hmm. only because uh, i think when i I could be wrong. I was up in uh, upstate mm-hmm. last summer, the summer before. I think it was my ex-wife, who's an actress, had... What's her name? Karen Pittman. Mm-hmm. She was working on a play, at, and they were doing it at Bard. Uh-huh. Which I know is uh, near yeah, where you guys close, yeah. have a home, right? Yeah, yeah. Because I saw... I, I had done... Uh, your your Lily had been on the podcast with Coldlands, which was shot up in that area, yeah. too. Yeah, yeah. And Tom... Also, I think uh, I think those were I think yeah he did it separately, but uh, nevertheless. Uh, so I was up there. I ran into her at a cafe. Uh-huh. This was after I had already met her. She I don't think she she may I may have looked a little familiar to her. Yeah, yeah. But I, was, I just ran into her there. I brought this up for oh so yeah so I think maybe it's possible your daughter was with her. I'm trying to well remember. if there was yeah I mean if you can't remember I don't know but, but if there was. <laughs> A child it's, with her I'd, I'd just, it's very likely would have been our daughter. Yeah, yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm thinking there was. You know. I think there was. I, 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 my, my, our kids, my kid was with there, and, and so I was very focused on that. I guess. Yeah. But it was a surprise. Yeah. To see anybody been on my podcast in the yeah, cafe, yeah. I didn't know. <laughs> I put it all together, you know. Mm-hmm. Anyway, but that's got a. F- do you? I mean, the the. Uh, I guess what I was trying to get at earlier was um, this this. Uh, whole thing which uh, the big question is how you would get from the kind of life uh well, that took you through the t- 20s and uh working at the um at pine street inn mm-hmm. yeah, pine, pine, street, pine street, inn. street inn which was the shelter 
You're obviously reconnecting with your father at that point uh, in in a very unusual way. Yeah. And then, uh, and your mother having died only, um, I'm guessing, a few years before that. Yes. Yeah. She would have died about four years before I met my father. Okay. Four or five years. Yeah. And I don't remember in the timeline when you gave up uh, drinking. Or a couple years, a couple years, a couple years after I met my father. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it's still continuing at that point. Still in my twenties. Yeah. Okay. Tail end of my twenties. Yeah. And did you stop that destructive behavior, self-destructive behavior? <laughs> we'll call it the general blanket mm-hmm. term. Was that while you were still at the shelter? Working yeah. At the shelter. Uh huh. Yeah. There so, were a lot of so- sober people working at the shelter. Oh sure. Uh, you know, I mean, part of the the irony is, as part of my job at the shelter for at various points was to drive people to detox. You know, take, and I was still using at the time, and so it's, it's sort of an irony. I was very aware of alcoholism and of, uh, you know, the the you know the consequences of drug use and, and alcohol and like and, on very serious it. levels. Yeah, right. yet it didn't stop me. Uh, you know, until until it did. You know, but I I went for quite a while. I mean, I I probably was at the shelter for five years using. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You know. And sure. You would think with it all around you, with the consequences at your literally, you're picking it up off funny. your feet. The brain is funny, yeah. Yeah, how you um, just sort of justify. I was studying. Or... I was studying alcoholism in, you know, getting a degree in like social work and stuff. I was like studying it, the yeah. effects, and yeah. This was a uh, it's after. Uh, this was, this was, a, was what, after I dropped out of school. Um, I. Uh, Continue. I got my degree eventually, but by taking classes at UMass Boston and other places, and one and I sort of went into like a social work track uh, when I was working at the shelter. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, so that was what that is. And so at some point, it sounds like though I guess the uh, was, I would imagine you're struggling. So especially because you were, if you're t- doing drugs or t- drinking to excess, that uh, you're numbing yourself from pain. It's generally what. What, why people do it? Not always, but uh, I'm just wondering when you can when that change occurred. It doesn't. I know it's not overnight. When you, we all when, like to when, think that, but it's. You mean when? When would? When did I stop wanting to numb myself from pain? Or yeah, and when you decided to kind of go forward uh, in a healthy because you know the the, the the a lot of people don't survive that 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 sort of uh, uh a recipe uh, it's a recipe for a real disaster sure. to to extremely self destructive parents yeah your dad survived miraculously too yeah i mean say. well sort of survived I mean, he's he was, around still yeah you know, he died a couple of years ago oh, but he sorry. died of okay. old age right I mean, no no right basically yeah sure yeah and your and your yeah. mom's story you know and she yeah. Sounds like um, well, I'm not going to I'm not yeah. going to uh, put a narrative on that because it's uh, I just don't know enough and I shouldn't yeah. anyway. But but you you should have turned out to be uh, drink yourself to death or something like like that. You know what I mean? I mean it, it just well, how there, you there, you may, you know. I guess but there I'm, are many ways. I mean, there's, you know, there's a few things in that question. There's a you know to to get sober to quit drinking or to quit doing drugs. I mean. Uh, you know what they say is that there's some sort of a you know moment of grace or something of something it's it's sort of un unmeasurable you don't really know why there's no real rhyme or reason to it there's no like this is the moment or this is the thing that would do it you know there's no um you know so the, and I, I i for me that's the case there's no real like i can't really point to something but it's also like the the use of drugs and alcohol i mean they, you know they were very good friends for a long time it wasn't just to numb pain it was also you know there was a it created community. It created a tribe of people. I mean, you know, I'm sure you were Creates. drinking and using drugs in your day, and no. never, you never drank or used drugs, <laughs> <laughs> really. Uh, Not to excess, I'm saying, but there was, there was yeah. in the culture, yes, there was no, around. Yes, and there's a certain like you know, there's certain you know, there's a certain sure. The, at least the way I did it, there, you know, it I, I absolutely did, and I, I don't, I, my, yeah. I just waited longer to to do it, uh huh, than yeah. you know. So, but it created a lot of, there was a lot of good that came out of it. A lot of like necessary things. Like Mm -hmm. it sort of like, you know, very, very likely kept me alive, uh, you know, for a long time until it didn't, until it sort of became, uh, you know, problematic, uh, you know, at a certain point it turns and becomes problematic. Um, so, you know, sometimes, you know, sometimes it's the solution, you know, it's not always the problem. Uh, true. And when you're younger, like you, you, 
you know, you don't have many resources, many tools uh, to deal with emotional things or to deal with uh, just even how to like navigate the world. And drugs right. and alcohol, and on your own. drugs and alcohol could be like an easy ticket. Like this is the answer to a lot of those questions. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think it's it's I don't think it's good or bad. I think mm-hmm. it's just, it can be at a certain point. If it turns bad, then you should probably do something else about it. You know, like yeah. if it. Well, I think for yeah. me, I don't think it was such a yeah. a threat because yeah. although it could have been, but it, I mean, for well, my, you might not for be an story, addict. You might not be an addict. I don't know? think I'm yeah. an addict. Yeah. luckily, yeah. Yeah. but also. But maybe I – well, you know, I don't know. But but, but also I had parents who were kind of guiding me, you uh-huh. know. And, yeah. you know, I mean they were far from perfect, God knows, but uh, they were there and they were loving. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and and so what I'm saying is is that it was set – you know, you were set up for a possibly yeah. a very different path. And so it's just always to me kind of a, a big deal when, when you – but, but you chose things like uh, maybe you were helping your mom. Uh, I don't know, maybe you were there and you were helping your mother. That was your role. Mm-hmm. Um, it's been a few years since I've read another uh, book. Help her. So then, I, then my role became to help in the shelter. And then you right? chose a role where you you're, are helping people and social work in general is about learning how to do that and to yeah. aid people that need help. And so perhaps that was a, uh, a, a helping yourself on some level. I don't know. But I think we're Arm all chair psychiatrist. But I think we all have like you know many you know we, we contain multitudes. It's like that can be one aspect of it, and then there can be other aspects that are you know more uh, you know less altruistic. There could be some that are more damaging, some that are more purely creative, some that are more spiritual. Like and they're all like it's it's a very strange mix of what creates a person. You know, there's not really one thing. As far as I can tell, so, and working in the shelter wasn't one thing either. It was like many things. It was it was political. Yeah. It was a weird tribe. It was a place to get drunk and get laid. It was for a you, weird for, for the people that for me for the, for you too. Well, yeah. Okay. Yeah, we all slept together. <laughs> everyone, everyone who worked there slept together. Yeah. Okay. You mean the staff? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, some of the some of the staff slept with the people that. Came in. Okay. <laughs> you know, it was like, Man, I, I literally. Have, speaking of shelters, <laughs> I live my own shelter. I mean, like any job. It was like any job. Like you know. Okay. True. Coworkers sleep with each other. That's I mean, true. You no, know, no. and then sometimes you sleep with the clients. I mean, it's just that's right. I don't know. It's, yeah. No, you're right. It's like you're in the world. You're in the world. So well said. So it was many things. It wasn't just to say that I was there as like some altruistic saint wouldn't be accurate, and to say even after I quit drinking that suddenly my life got better and I got on a good track and stopped being self destructive. Like that wouldn't be accurate either, uh, you know. So it's always a it's a it's always a daily navigation through yeah. these, you know, to figure out who you are and why you do things. I think, mm-hmm. which is why I, I write. Actually, it's to sort of figure that out too. I sort of like to, you know, push myself into uncomfortable places in my writing, uh, and to it, it's it's sort of as a way to sort of think like, oh, there's this thing I haven't talked about that I do. Like, let's sort of see what that is. Like, if I look at that a little closer, you know, and mm-hmm. try to figure out. Uh, um, you know, sources of behavior and things, you know. So The writing could have been definitely uh, also a nice contribution to this. I may have to wake her up. <laughs> She's so loud. It's anyway, funny, the, um, so, time my kid. so strange, the, uh, mm-hmm. the noveller who I'm doing the yeah, Blake yeah, yeah. thing with just texted me that says, oh. you're on the radio right now reading Embrace Noir. That's so funny. Like public radio or something? I don't know, yeah, oh, yeah. Interesting. What? Well, you know, if I find their, her music, I can yeah, add it to it the. I can add it to the. the yeah. Uh, I just, two L's. It's two L's. No, oh, thank. I, I was totally. Uh, yeah. yeah. I figured I was going to have to. I didn't decide it. Uh, um, you know, it's funny because I, ha- as I mentioned, I have my hardbound edition, and I don't know. I think it's in a store, my storage or something, so you had to go which buy I have to go. One. Well, you know, yeah. I figured. Well, yeah. It was a. Uh, was, I would wrap it for Christmas. I, <laughs> I had to run into Manhattan this morning to pick up a a Lego gift card for my son. Anyway, so mm-hmm. <laughs> so I stopped by the Strand. Yeah, I actually was tr- going to try to get another one of your titles, but apparently they're so popular because the guy said, "Oh, we should have every title," and then he looked and uh, only this. Huh. Okay. So yeah. I, I, I hope that means good things. <laughs> I, I'd like no, but I'm looking. depends if you're ha- glass half empty or glass half full kind of guy. Trying to be, uh, yeah. Half, I drank half the glass, yeah. and uh, which I is need... better, half empty or half full? I never really figured that out. Really. I think well, the the the, uh, the bullies empty. will say half full is the optimistic view, right? And then I guess yeah, 
But I've never made sense I'm, to me. I, the way I interpret it generally is I'm half as thirsty as you know yeah. I yeah. need to be, yeah. or something like that. So, well, uh, I also I think I mentioned this to to Lily when I talked to her some time ago. I know we didn't have a lot of time because it was one of those cases where it was around the cold lands and you yeah, kind of have a slot yeah. Yeah. and it's you know publicists are kind of putting together the whole day and so. Uh-huh. But um, I remembered that as a uh, I had uh, when I moved back to after living in Boston, I moved back to New York in the late 80s, and I joined the public theater because I grew up, my parents would t- were members, and they would take me to these plays that were s- scarring yeah, for yeah. a little kid to see, you know. But by the time I, you know, was of age, a young guy, and it was still relatively inexpensive to, yeah. to go see a play at the public theater. So I became a member, and I remember it was 88 or 89. At the Foreman. I, I was introduced to... Foreman? Richard Foreman? Or was it... Who was the play, right? Oh, she, did, she, she did this one play that was. I just remember I was sitting in the front with my then girlfriend and my dad, because I, you know, yeah. just got extra tickets to this play. And this woman walks out. This young woman. She's so young. She looked like a teenager back then too, yeah. and she still looks amazing. But she, she was like, uh, I was like, she's so uh, unique and unusual. Who is this person? <laughs> this actress? And she was so good. Yeah, it just, uh, just, it, and I never forgot. And then I started, of course, to see yeah, her yeah. in films yeah, and, yeah. and do stuff, and I was like, not surprised she, at she all. Came, so. She came to New York to do a Richard Foreman play. It could have been. Um, she remembered it because she told yeah. me the play at the, yeah. in that interview. So I, I have to bring it up. Which um, was such a big deal. The, the Foreman plays when I even when I first came to New York, I'd go see all his plays. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And you you have one play th- at least. I have one play, called, yeah. yeah. Called, uh, if off the top of my head, Alice invents a little game and always wins. Alice invents a little game and Alice always wins. And Alice always wins. Yes. Okay. Yeah. See, I shouldn't memorize these That's things. That's okay. That's okay. Yeah. <laughs> no, yeah. I wrote it down. Yeah. And Alice always wins. So uh, that that's already been a while, but w- that was uh, I noticed that was not per- was that not performed anywhere. It's or? been performed now since okay. then. Yeah, it's been it's, it was performed uh, I think last year in a theater in Chicago, Forget Me Not Theater in Chicago. Oh yeah, yeah, that's what it. I think I saw that. Name. Yeah, yeah. Okay, they just did it. Yeah, uh-huh. and, yeah. and so it gets performed once in a while. Yeah. What was that about? Uh, what was it about? I mean, it also had some sort of uh, uh, it's sort of, it's sort of this like broad allegory, maybe. Mm-hmm. I never even really tried to describe it, but maybe that's what it is. Uh, um, it was inspired by this, uh, in part by a, a blackout that the city had one summer, uh, and all these businessmen that were on the front page of the New York Times couldn't get home, and they just slept outside. They just like were sleeping on benches and stuff in these nice suits, like mm-hmm. sleep, like like mm-hmm. all around, like uh, uh, like Penn Station. It was really hot. It was like you know 100 degrees, and people were just yeah. sleeping like out, out like. They were just instantly became homeless. They right. couldn't get home. Yeah. They just slept. And it was just this weird, very strange photograph. Like, And so it sort of was that. It was sort of like... Curled the, up under newspapers. Yeah, yeah. yeah but grades. not even curled up. They just looked no, like, sort yeah, of like yeah. you know, they just took over a bench. It's sort mm-hmm. of like their version of homelessness mm-hmm. is they just, this is my bench. Like, yeah. And they, uh, it, it sort of has some of that. Like the, it's, a, it's, a, it's in a city. It's all outside a building. And it's uh, someone, the lead character, leaves the building, gets locked out, like forgets his keys, and then he just never gets back in the building the entire time. And... There's a businessman who's the, the power is out in the city, and that, so that's maybe why he can't get in. But he's like, "Wait, well, yeah, I just mm-hmm. uh, you know. it's like almost like a reverse, a no exit, yeah, no yeah, entrance, out, yeah, no entrance, yeah. You can't get in. The the, the building is a character at some point because he rings a bell and the, the building talks to him, oh. <laughs> but they won't. They sort of half buzz him in, and he can't get in in time. He can't oh. get the buzzer in time. So and, they're fu- they're fucking with him. Or the well, is. well, and then eventually once I see, he sort of half gets in or something. Yeah, there's yeah, there's a whole there's like four characters mm-hmm. in it. So. That never get inside. See, no one ever gets inside. Do you yeah. have any? Uh, do you ever think of writing another or working on another play eventually? I know. I, I mean, I, I I think about it a lot, but I, I think about a lot of things. Like I, yeah. I've been working on a something for Lily, you know, for a long time, yeah. just because I have, you know, I live with this like Amazing one of the actor. best actresses there is, and definitely. Uh, yeah. I, I it's possible I don't have like uh, the aptitude. Maybe poetry's destroyed me or something to write like to move people around in the world in a certain way like that the play is very odd it's an odd play mm-hmm. uh, I mean I really enjoyed doing it and I'm, I'm working on this other thing now um, I might do it again but other projects is, just always come up there's always like other projects that I sort of like I, I so I am working on some sort of screenplay uh, or play type thing mm-hmm. and then I put it aside and then do Blake for a while and 
you know, do poems. Right, I understand. Right about Mr. Man. Yeah, like, yeah. There's this four or five projects going on at once, but one of them and is... And the order uh, presents, the order in the, the, the presents intuitive. itself yeah. with yeah, yeah. Yeah, a yeah. number of different uh, components to what might be your next thing. Yeah, yeah, and it's, it's yeah. whatever sort of like Pres- yeah. demands my attention or whatever. Right. Or just my attention goes to. Yeah, because imagine another Hollywood movie could, could be... Uh, if it's a good one, that's always the rub, right? Uh, yeah. You know, if it's a lucrative one, that that's helpful. On occasion, that could be. Uh, I could on see occasion, that. yeah, money that on occasion be, would be helpful. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm getting at. Yeah, yeah. that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, sure. Especially with in ten years from now, especially <laughs> college. <laughs> yeah, I'm starting to think. Yeah, I don't have. I have half that time, so I'm. Yeah, but fortunately, actually, his mother is doing. I think has a great career, so, so yeah. not po- have time for podcasting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, well, I didn't want to spend that much time on uh, I, as we wind down because uh, it's uh, I don't want to keep it too long. But I know that there's a lot of other interviews and and information out there about <clears throat> making another night, uh, uh, another bullshit night in Suck City into a, adapting it into a film, mm-hmm. and now they've decided that your book is called being flynn well just that one film tie-in book yeah I it's know. still called you know the bullshit nights like yeah so, yeah but you may find it under either yeah. title yeah, at yeah. My point, right? yeah uh the publisher is smart they know i'm just seeing if they've actually mm-hmm. listed it in this thing it's oh yeah another possible title i don't know i don't think they have May, oh maybe it was that just the edition that came out in in tandem with the uh yeah, yeah. The, with the release with the of the film, film. yeah yeah, yeah I think it's, it didn't do so well thankfully the, with, the the film or no the book the book the oh. tie-in the tie-in the this, tie-in this, version this one always sold better yeah oh that's good to know yeah and articles uh and and information about how you're you know of course having your father and that whole experience it must have been kind of surreal just having your dad out there meeting uh the guys playing your dad, De Niro, and, oh, that's yeah. who it was, yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah, that whole experience. But so I didn't want to uh, spend too much time on on that. This is was was fascinating to me, just sort of kind of getting an idea of where. Yeah, Dad, but I noticed the podcast called Film Wax, right? It's Film very Wax true. So, it? I, so it's I, kind I'm of an irony. I was sort of thinking, I was expecting a little irony. film sort of talk. So then I diverted it to Blake. So, you know, before yeah. film was even invented, I sort of went back to Blake. That's fine, though. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, I you know John Lurie. Yeah. Well, I don't know him, but I know. Who you know, he is. you yeah. know who he is. So, yeah. so yeah. Well, this was a case where you know, like I approached him um, through originally through Twitter because he he has a presence on Twitter. Uh huh. And um, reached out. He, he doesn't want to talk about. He he was open to the idea, and we actually ended up skyping just to introduce each other, you know, to each yeah. other, and talk for quite a while. But he he you know he's got a big person, a complicated personality, mostly in a positive way. But he um, didn't want to talk about certain people he's worked with in the past, yeah. whose name starts with a J, yeah, yeah. and another who. Tom Waits yeah, is yeah, another. Yeah. He just didn't want, and so he goes, "I don't really want to talk about the films." And I said, "Well, you know, but you know, you don't have to." Yeah. And so some time passed, and then one day I saw that he was on a very popular podcast um, called the WTF. Yeah. <laughs> so, and I was just like, "Oh wow, okay." And he goes, "Well, you do a film podcast." And I said, "Well, it's my podcast. I can have on anybody I want," which is yeah. getting to the point. I mean, it. You know, we could have talked about more about uh, that a- adaptation, I suppose. Mm-hmm. And I'm certainly interested in it, uh, but at the same time, I kind of was just more interested in getting to know, yeah, you know, your story a bit. And, yeah, that's uh, I, I I appreciate that. I, that was uh, not that I I would talk about anything; it doesn't matter. But just right now, like this morning, like I said, I was recording this Blake stuff, and so that's sort of what that's on your mind. Almost. Yeah, that, and then it's occupying your. I just found out that my next book of poems just got taken. I found that out this morning. By Grey Wolf, so oh right, and they've done all your past. They've done uh, the past books of poems, so, yeah, yeah. They so do, they do the poetry, yeah. They've been in for the big uh, for the the journey here. Yeah, and they, well, and it's, it's, it's never it's never certain. Right? This will be the fifth collection, mm-hmm. and it's never certain. You know, like if if they didn't like it, they wouldn't take it. I would hope so. And it took them a while. Like I was I was actually a little wondering. Uh-huh. <laughs> so the new ones, the new ones called "I Will Destroy You," uh-huh. uh, is the new uh, <laughs> book of poems. And when is that coming out? I mean, what is the uh, the? Uh, the oh no! Usually, it's like you know, what's going to be two seventeen soon, probably two eighteen. Oh really? Oh, it takes at least a year. Yeah, just from the time of uh, oh, yeah, letting you know yeah. we're the the sign on. I think if we're lucky, it'll be two eighteen. So the my feelings is, is that the name of it? Yeah, my feelings. My yeah. feelings, which I think is a great title. Yeah. You read? Fr- I think you read from that. 
at uh, when I met you a couple weeks ago mm. at the New York and Cafe. No, I think I read from this. You read from that? The did new you read book? Did you I read from? The book? Yeah, I read from the new book. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, maybe you're right. Actually, I did. Yeah, yeah. yeah I didn't because I'm, I'm sort of. Just I'm in the mi- I was in the middle of these poems, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then I and then I shifted over to the Blake right after that. So, yeah. Uh, and that is, and that's I'm obviously very excited about it. So, hence your or just inspired. Well, it, it, you know, it's like workshopping them. Like you, you read yes. them in public just to see how they work, and it, it's it's sort of a way to edit them mm-hmm. too. Yeah, sure. The book needs to be edited. Is reading? I noticed like at that evening, which was this uh, part of this little. Uh, the International, International Literature Festival, yeah. yeah. Uh, you First of all, you're not, you're, uh, do they count uh, Massachusetts now as uh, international? Uh, <laughs> I was wondering, first of all, I did wonder why. Well, technically, I think it's international, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> well, you're, inter- I mean, American is international to all the other countries that were up there. Yeah, I, I, th- it's international in the sense of these are just different writers from all different countries, including our own. Not yeah, I think was are, was I the only one that was like sort of from Massachusetts? Like, cause or in Nick, America. Nick Laird was is from England, and mm-hmm. the other people were that. were maybe even based in America, but they weren't from America. Oh, yeah, they so were. Maybe they think I'm not from America. I don't know. It's kind of, I, I, I was happy to be there. Calling something inter- like we have international film festivals. That just means that um, in addition to domestic there's films, there's, there okay, is also yeah. international titles. I guess that's, that's what all. they did. So that must be what that is about. And sometimes they're under the false impression that like, if they put like, you know, my name or someone else, local person's name in, more people will come because they'll know that name. Right. Well, that makes Which sense. Which turns out not to be true at all. But it was, it, was, yeah. it, was, it was a decent turnout for us. It was a small venue, let's face yeah. it. And, and I'm always No, I was impressed. totally happy with it. I was, I was very yeah. happy with yeah. the, to nice be vibe. with those poets. Yeah, it was sure. great. So it was really fascinating. Yeah. Great, a great uh, festival they do. But I, w- I guess that what I, was, I saw on this, and we can finish here, but I just uh, was realized reading and the cadence and the tone is so crucial, and it must take just forever to kind of get that, you know, to develop that. It's almost like singing in the sense of uh, you have to develop a tool. Yeah, well, well, in two of these, well, like, the, like I said, the Blake thing is being done with the idea of performing it with a musician, the whole, that whole thing. So a lot of what I'm editing is for that. Yeah. Uh, for what will be, and I'm, so I'm I'm recording it to see what can actually, you know, what comes out of your mouth and what can fit in your mouth. Uh, and with this other one too, I did a lot of these poems with these two musicians, these two great musicians, uh, Simi Stone and Philip Marshall. A lot of these were workshop with them. We performed mm-hmm. them with mm-hmm. a, with a band, um, and so that was like a way to have them in the world too. So yeah, and they change. They change now. They have this m- musical element, even if you don't hear it. Uh, you know, if, even if you don't, if I don't perform them with the music, it's still in it. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. It 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 it, it, it has um, uh, Im, Im, had, embodied. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I don't know. Imbued. Imbued. That's a good. Infused. <laughs> <laughs> Impressed. I don't know. Impressed. It's a palin. Obsessed. Yeah. Is that what that means? Palin well, says. Palin says like a. Like like the pressure on a piece of paper that's then erased and you can sort of see the ghost image of it okay is that yeah. is that what they do on 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 grape uh, stones too or is that something uh, that's grave, that's just grave uh, rubbings yeah yeah, yeah. Or well, you can actually see the thing this is like you don't oh. it's like a white piece of paper but there's like a like maybe the pressure of the pen on it mm-hmm. like if a, a notepad oh, yeah. i think if you wrote on one page and took it off then that's i think that's a palimpsest i could be that's a you're gonna get you're gonna get a I shitload think, of bad. You know, <laughs> I hope so. Yeah, at email least about will be listening. Saying, what? That's good. You know, I'm glad to know that there. I think yeah. a lot of people will be interested in this episode actually, because uh, I think you're a great, uh, great writer and storyteller. And, oh, thanks. Uh, yeah, and uh, maybe we'll get a chance one day to do it again. And, uh, you'll have to come. You'll have to come and hear the uh, Blake right. performance when I when, when I you do it. That'll probably will, be absolutely. sooner. It'll probably be sooner than the book of poems, just because that's you know I can control this. The, I think the dog's scratching or something. Unless it's your Unless my son is Grendel. scratching at the dog. <laughs> oh, that's a good point. Yeah. <laughs> I like, do have is that. Grendel next? Somebody's is Grendel up next? Somebody tails me all the time. Mm-hmm. And, uh, yeah, yeah. The dog. All right, well, well Nick, yeah. Nick, thank you so much, really. Yeah, and it's a pleasure yeah. to getting to yeah. know you. Yeah. yeah. All right. <laughs>